HBCU Digest Radio, welcome back to our presidential series. Uh, privileged to have uh, conversations with executives and leaders from our historically black colleges and universities. Today, our privileged guest, the president of Miles College, uh, Dr. George French, and also Brother Chuck Fouch. He is the executive director of The Yard, and this is a unique uh, organization that is working with HBCUs uh, throughout the country. Uh, to spur economic development and awareness of black colleges. So, brothers, it is indeed a, an honor to have you on today. Uh, Brother Foss, I think we will start with you because this is something that um, Brother French actually brought to the fore, at least for me. Um, and this is a really unique thing because this we talk often about public and private partnerships. But this is one that, that really talks about how do we do that in areas that need it the most. Uh, talk about what the yard is and how you guys kind of came together to forge this partnership to help develop uh, Fairfield and, and HBCU communities around the South. Well, well thank you first for uh, just allowing me to, to, to spend some time with you. And uh, let me thank Dr. French uh, for not only his, his leadership locally, but I'm going to call it globally. I just learned from him he will be, you know, across the water in Africa pretty pretty soon and uh, you know and I think that's a good place to start because a lot of times when we see people we, we see them in the context of which we know them and not uh, not remember sometimes I have to be reminded about how far reaching the work that we do uh, or not do uh, can, can can affect people and I'm just I'm really honored and happy to, to know this guy who um, is as much a, uh, I'm gonna call it a player uh, in Fairfield, in Birmingham, in Alabama, as he is across across the world. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I mean that sincerely because uh, you know, learning now is not uh, distanced uh, as it is, you know, just really one on one um, uh, life skills and application. And a lot of the things that I've learned, I learned on this yard at Miles College. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that's why you know the, the circle has has come back uh, to um, being able to work together uh, as an example for others. So you asked me what the yard is. The yard is tech, talent, and culture. Mm -hmm. And those three words are 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 directly tied to innovation, inclusion, and infrastructure, which is the platform for uh, the U.S. Conference of Mayors. And I have to give a shout out to uh, Mayor Stephen Benjamin of Columbia, South Carolina, who's also the president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, who, when we were working on this platform of innovation, inclusion, and uh, infrastructure, um, really saw the work. And I used Dr. French as, as an example of how an HBCU that's really firing on all s cylinders to hit each of these three points and hit them well not just hit them, but hit them well, and to make a difference. And so we, we used Miles as the model uh, for this national initiative. And basically what the yard is, um, is creating pipelines, career pipelines, um, for students to be matched up with not just available jobs today, but expected jobs of tomorrow. So that's, that's number one. Then, then secondly, is those students who are graduating, um, inclusion goes both ways. You know, we always think of it, you know, as, a, as being at a company when, you know, the boardroom does not look like the yard and, and, and it should. Um, right. And so, <laughs> right, right. you know, uh, uh, not only are we affecting the boardroom and the workforce, um, but inclusion also means for the HBCU, for us to be able to uh, to to see the best and brightest minds of the world to come to our campuses uh, to show our students what we don't know because really we don't know what we don't know uh, you know uh, and finally from an infrastructure standpoint it is absolutely uh, building the very best uh, the very best infrastructure that we can so that you know our housing. Uh, looks like the presidential village at 
a predominantly white university. You know, uh, if you come on this campus, uh, you will see, and I'm going to let Dr. French tell his own story, but, you know, from the time you drive up, you will see a sign that says, here we grow again, you know, and then you drive up and then you see a new building, then you see another new building, then you see a rehab building or, or, or a building that's been enhanced. And it's like, uh, this is the model. This is the place where we can say to everyone else, um, here's how you do it. Man. But, but that's, that's what's so interesting. And when you look at some of the, I guess, the blueprint behind this initiative, um, a lot of it comes from your experience working in uh, Alabama legislature, uh, working with you know the private sectors. How are you able to communicate the vision from Dr. French, which we'll get to in a second, and translate that over to those partners and say, here's why it's a fit. When there's so many colleges and universities in Alabama, um, how do you how, how do you effectively make the case for a miles or another campus? And I think that's what a lot of presidents and stakeholders and graduates from HBCUs want to know. Like, I love that vision. So how do I, how do I make it possible for the folks in my community? Well, I think we are empowering campuses and communities one at a time. And for all of us, we sort of operate in a, a bubble uh, because we really want to effect, effectuate and impact change where we are. But again, as my first statement was, not realizing that when we impact locally, we're also impacting globally. So rather than operating independently, operating collectively. Um, and, and let me give you one example of uh, uh, let me go back to infrastructure for a second. You know, looking at efficiencies on a campus, and, and, and I, I probably should give you a, um, go back to my former days. I'm a, I'm a media guy, but I spent five years as chief of staff uh, for the city of Birmingham uh, to the mayor and, and was able uh, to really, when you talk about public and private partnerships, mm-hmm. is to see how everybody has their own agenda, but once you put people in a room and you start to connect the dots, you see that our needs are pretty much the same. Right. And so efficiencies of scale mean that if Dr. French is is looking at a refinancing of some debt, or he's looking at building a building, uh, or, or looking at efficiencies across infrastructure, if we had... Uh, companies who were ready and willing to not only look at miles individually but collectively, that means that those efficiencies would would be able to be cast farther. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you're refinancing, that that rate can be a little different. The closing cost can be a little different. That means that the more it goes back to the basic principle of the more you save. Who said that, Dr. French? The more you say, the more you earn right. is yours to keep. I think that was a local guy here in, yeah. in Birmingham. Yeah. Uh, so, so you know, when you when you look at how we can operate collectively, um, it gives us so much more strength together than when we are uh, independent of each other. So, real change with infrastructure. Uh, real change with inclusion and real change, meaningful change uh, with innovation. Um, and so that's where those three words came from, tech, talent, and culture, because it, it, they're real in our space. And just so everybody listening is clear, this is a program that is has worked to extend to Benedict College in South Carolina. Um, it has roots in New Orleans, uh, in in. Uh, in uh, not Shreveport, but Baton Rouge at Southern University. Um, so this is something that is that is working across the entire HBCU sector, um, or has the, the great potential to do so uh, with a lot of uh, corporate partners uh, working in, in concert with it. But uh, Dr. French, um, you know, you you've had this career where you know Fairfield is kind of reimagined as a result of what you've done and are doing with the campus. Um, from your perspective as a chief executive officer of an academic enterprise, uh, one that has to make money, but, <laughs> but for the, the goal of educating people, how, do, how does this work in your, in your purview uh, to say, well, 
we're doing all these things. We're making a, be- a Fairfield a better place to live. We're making Alabama a better place to live. But this benefits my students. How? Exactly. L- listen, um, let me first give a shout out to uh, HBCU Digest. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you, HBCU Digest is the informer for practitioners within this space. And it's invaluable. And, and we at Miles College and throughout the higher education community really appreciate the impact uh, that you're making and you are informing decisions. So I, I just really want to uh, to say a word of appreciation to you, uh, Brother Jerry. Now, you just exposed everybody that I owe you a steak dinner and an alpha pen, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, okay. that's just fine but I appreciate it <laughs> but yes sir well, we'll do it now. i tell you what uh, this, this brother that's sitting with me uh, Chuck Fosh we, we, are, we are pleased that, that he's working uh, with Miles and, and with HBCUs across the nation because we are effectuating what's going on in these various cities we happen to sit uh, within the city of Fairfield we're surrounded by the city of uh, Birmingham as Fairfield is basically a suburb of the city of Fairfield. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we are uh, effectuating change within our city, uh, even within the uh, uh, political, uh, although Miles is a political, we are very active in the political arena. And for the first time in history, we have a voting box on the campus of Miles College. Mm-hmm. It's moved uh, primarily from within, within the city of Fairfield to the, camp, to the beautiful campus of Miles. Mm-hmm. So our residents come to the campus to engage the campus, and we engage the city. Uh, we're very uh, active in assisting Fairfield in their revitalization. Of course, Miles is the largest employer within the city. Uh, we pay actually more taxes than anyone with, within the city, occupational and other. So we're, we're pleased to support our city. We're also actually the, uh, the latest uh, developers within the city, having constructed three buildings here on campus simultaneously, and we've expanded um, exponentially. We've about tripled the size, uh, the land size, size of the campus during my administration now with the purchase of the North Campus, and then we purchased several city blocks around the campus. So we're, we're spurring revitalization, and what we're doing now is we're putting together, we're plotting the entire city, and what we're looking to do is while we have dilapidated housing, unfortunately, throughout the city, what we're doing is we're going block by block, identifying some of the worst houses on and within those blocks, We're facilitating the purchases of those homes and the renovation of those homes, and then we we will turn around and sell those homes to faculty and staff members of Miles College. So we wind up basically with uh, a dispersion of Miles College faculty and staff within the Fairfield community that understand what home ownership is about, that understand what it is to really take care of the homes and to make the investments. And we will instill and are instilling now uh, a sense of pride as we uh, help the city to revitalize our housing stock and to increase our tax base. Interestingly enough, Doc, um, while we celebrate the victories of the civil rights struggles, there were some consequences that came along with some of our victories that we didn't really anticipate mm-hmm. uh, back in the 60s when we said that we wanted fair housing and we wanted to live wherever we wanted to live. We didn't anticipate that there would come a time in 2019 that all of our doctors and lawyers and pastors and teachers are moving out of the community uh, mm-hmm. over the mountain. Right. So we have a deteriorated mm-hmm. tax base, and we didn't really anticipate that. Mm-hmm. HBCUs didn't anticipate when we were uh, beating down the doors of the PWIs that we would come to a point of losing uh, many, so many, disproportionately, yeah. our star mm-hmm. athletes mm-hmm. to where we find ourselves now having to play football games for um uh, for cash, mm-hmm. uh, teams that we, we really, by and large, find it difficult to compete with. Mm-hmm. So if, if as a matter of fact, I was speaking to one of my friends the other day, and uh, he asked the question, what 
what could we do to really turn HBCUs around? And believe it or not, I told him that if our athletes returned to HBCUs and we were able to get the football contracts that the University of Alabama and other schools are, and we were able to send those kids to the pros and they gave back, we would be able to compete uh, financially and, and resource-wise with anyone in the nation. Yep. But right now, we're being stripped because we, we, we really didn't anticipate uh, those, those type of things going. So we have to, we have to deal the hand we're dealt, okay. but HBCUs, we have a pivotal role in, in, in trying to uh, make the playing field uh, more level right now. Okay. When you guys think about exactly that opportunity of equity, because um, that's what is at the core of, you know, the yard initiative. Uh, that's the at the core of what you just discussed, Brother French, about, you know, athletics and its role in development of campus. But just to round out from both of you guys, I would ask, it seems that we're getting to a time where, um, and I want to make sure I frame this correctly, racism still exists, but people are much more open to the idea of, even within that framework, we still got to make money and we still got to be here. That's everybody. So mm-hmm. with, within that framework, do you find that it, it is it is effective to maintain, I guess, the heritage and the, the cultural pride prospect of a Miles College or HBCU at large and leverage that for partnerships? Or do you find that you just have to say, hey, look, we're the biggest employer around here. We pay more taxes than everybody around here. So everybody, you know, act like we're supposed to be here. And this is not something that is a, is an HBCU conversation, but rather a finance and sustainability conversation. Because I think that our constituents kind of, they push it one way, but I think leaders see it another way because they're interacting with all different kinds of people. But our constituents want, hey, we want, we want HBCU all over the place, as they should. But our leaders know that if I want to make partnerships, maybe that's not so much of the the messaging we need. So how do you both of you find that you you manage those two audiences for what the community and the campus ultimately need? Well, if I could, if I could start, uh, start there. Miles, like like you said, we, we celebrate our history and our relevance in in historical context. But we also emphasize the relevance going forward. For example, we're, we're looking to diversify and our, our are diversifying our revenue streams. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why we're into cyber security. That's why we're working with Homeland Security as a leader within this space. Uh, the only school in, in, in the country and the world that has had and hosted the director of the CIA the director of the DIA and the director of um, uh, national security all on our campus within a six week time frame because of our relationships uh, with those areas. We realize that national security is always the order of the day. And right now, national security more than boots on the ground, it's, a, it's about intelligence. It's about the fact that we found ourselves as a nation in the middle of a war based on bad intel when there were no weapons of mass destruction found in that particular uh, theater. Mm -hmm. So what we need is we need people who look like us as we have different uh, conflicts in different theaters around the world. Many of those will be in our Africa. We need people that look like us to go in and get the intelligence. Uh, that's, That's the bottom line. And, and we, we have to train our students to serve our nation in intelligence by taking Arabic and Urdu and Farsi on our campuses. And then once they graduate, they're able to go right into the intelligence community and serve our country. All while Miles College diversifies our sources of revenue. We can't remain tuition driven forever right so right. Uh, that's that's one of the things that uh that we're doing here at miles Chuck? i i think you just spoke to um the early conversation about locally globally and the fact that that miles is training folks here on this campus creating uh an economic pipeline uh, but looking beyond the families of those who are who are 
are, are benefiting from the education and benefiting from the job. Yeah. And what, what he's wow. saying is that we're asking those very same people that we've educated, the very same people that have secured jobs, growing families, and boy, it's going to sound cliche. Don't forget where you came from, boy. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it it's, is and it's not about the give back when there is, and I'm, and I'm going to use uh, Miles as, a, as an example. When M Day comes around, don't send something uh, to, to help with some hot dogs, okay? You know, sponsor a student coming to Miles and stay with them throughout the entire process of, and that's what we were talking about earlier, of not only getting the degree, but skilling and reskilling. And I'm going to use myself as an example. One of my proudest moments was when Dr. French called me and said, we're going to award you a, a doctorate. Mm -hmm. And I will forever be grateful uh, because I, I just, I feel like had I not had the experience of somebody putting their hands on me mm -hmm. after I got a, a degree, is helping me to understand how to apply that degree wow. and then keeping my my cents and my dollars where it started from yep. and so when you talk about an economic pipeline you know it, it's it's really not just educating these companies and corporations about the value and the talent pool that we've got it is also about uh, engaging ourselves to say okay we want to grow um, then we, we can't do the same things we've been doing. Right. And I want to speak one, and if I got 20 seconds, I want to speak to the sports part of it. Mm -hmm. Is quite often we always focus, and, and we used to do classics. We, we, were, we were part of broadcast for, for um, black college uh, classics. And uh, back, you did our first class. You, you we did, did our first class. We did. Yeah. We actually the first, yeah. the first one that we did on Fox Sports way back in the day before it, when it, when it used to be Fox Sports South and Fox Sports Midwest and mm -hmm. East and all that was Miles College. Yeah, it was a Labor Day Classic, and what really uh, what was a challenge then, as it is a challenge today, it's the same challenge. Is our times were late when we were on, you know, when we were on the air. And, and then, then our, our, our companies and corporations would ask us, our partners and sponsors would ask us to deliver impressions. Well, how can you deliver impressions when you're not in a space and time? Right. When at that time people were watching. Right. right. <laughs> right. You, you know, it's, it's, it's like asking somebody to stay up till 11 o'clock at night with a game that had already ended three hours earlier. Now, that is not the case today because we can watch what we want, when we watch, when we want where and how and we can do that on demand but the resource pool the disparity gap is still there so you know again collectively creating those economic synergies not just from outside but from inside as well